welcome to an introduction to the world's religions. Today we begin our unit on Chinese religions. Does China have religion? Some of you are undoubtedly saying, of course, Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, these are all religions that were reared if not born in China. Others of you are saying these are more like traditions or philosophies than religion. This is one of those questions students of religion will debate endlessly over coffee or more spirited drinks, but it's an important one because it challenges us to think about what we mean by religion. We're going to think about this question through the story of Matteo Ricci. Ricci was a 16th century Jesuit on a mission to bring the Catholic religion to the Chinese people. I want you to take a moment to guess how this played out. What do you think happened when this foreigner arrived at the Chinese royal court? Final answer, the king hired Matteo Ricci to work in the court and allowed him to preach. Now if you're not shocked by this turn of events, imagine if Catholic missionaries had crossed the Atlantic in the 16th century and started working in the courts of the Maya, the Aztecs, and the Inca. The New World would be a very different place. So what was different about China? When Ricci arrived in China, he was taken aback. The Chinese were not without the trappings of the civilized Christian Europeans. They too had texts, including the oldest continually used language in all of history. They had centuries-old rituals, and they had wealth in all the ways Europe coveted, tea, spices, and silk. And most importantly, they had bureaucracy, the ability to manage tons of people over tons of land for tons of time. This means that everything Ricci learned in Missionary 101 had to be thrown out. He couldn't just walk up to the king and say, King, if you believe in my God, you'll become wise and rich and powerful. The king already had all that without Ricci's religion. The question for us is whether what Ricci noticed is something we'd call religion. However you ascribe that kind of power, it had a long history in China. During the second half of the second millennium, one group of people proved especially adept at managing themselves. They became known as the Shang Dynasty. With literacy, bureaucracy, and advanced blacksmith abilities, they ushered in the definitive start to urbanization in China. This provided the makings for historical records, mail, accounting, and all things needed for a large-scale civilization. One invention pertinent to our discussion is that of divination. The king would take an ox's shoulder bone, or a turtle shell, and inscribe it with a question. After agitating the bone in some way, the king's advisors would interpret the text and the cracks and come up with an answer. Now over the centuries, this had been done on a limited scale, binary, yes, no, true, false type questions, but increasing levels of literacy permitted multiple choice questions. With the Shang, should I go into battle, yes or no, became should I go into battle in the fall, spring, winter, or summer? If you're wondering who is on the other side of the oracle bones, you're in good company. The king and his advisors wondered the same thing. They figured the answers were coming from an all-powerful being known as Shang-Ti, the ruler on high. Shang-Ti was over the sun, moon, earth, rivers, and the rain. Because Shang-Ti spoke back to the king through the oracle bones, the king was understood as Shang-Ti's human deputy. This political philosophy wasn't foolproof. Around a thousand, the Shang were outmatched by a new ruler from the Zhou dynasty. Around 1000 BCE, the Shang were outmatched by a new ruler from the Zhou dynasty. The Zhou dynasty advanced literacy, expanded the government, and developed ironworks. Zhou scholars understood the ruler on high as not just a celestial monarch, but as a heavenly empire, which they called Tian. The Zhou said that just as a human king can be a deputy of Tian, he can also lose his Tian Ming, or mandate of heaven. Kings can only rule under heaven so long as the people are well cared for. So when the people become unhappy, then the mandate of heaven has clearly moved on to someone else. The Zhou dynasty and their successors learned that it was in their best interest to find ways of ruling effectively. So they contracted sages to help them in this endeavor. During the middle of the first millennium, two people offered ideas that changed Chinese culture forever. One person was called Kung Fu Zi, or as Matteo Ricci called him, Confucius. 
Master Kong believed that prosperity depended on being righteous in relationship to one's family, fellow people, and heaven. His sayings were anthologized in a written collection called the Analects. These classic texts taught how to achieve excellence in history, art, politics, relationships, and seemingly all facets of life. Men's lives were intimately tied to their knowledge of the Analects. If you wanted to be a good father, if you wanted a good job, then you had to know your Confucius. An older contemporary Confucius saw life differently. Lao Tzu saw the intellects as too rigid and unfeasible. He encouraged people to go with the flow of the universe, known as the Tao. One is better off trying to harmonize with the Tao through channeling its inner vitality, the Te. This is done through striking a balance between chaos and order, or yin and yang. And sometimes it's done by not trying at all and resting in the way of the world. These ideas are modeled in a work called the Tao Te Ching, which models how astral beings are at one with the universe. Feng Shui, acupuncture, and tapping into one's qi are all practices derived from the teachings of Lao Tzu. Chinese religions were also open to foreign perspectives. Somewhere between the last centuries prior to the Common Era and the first centuries of it, missionaries from India visited royal Chinese courts. They taught that people are best off learning the futility of suffering and liberation. People must instead realize that the senses deceive and that this world is an illusion. Being enlightened enough to see this deception brings true peace. Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism are just three systems that Chinese rulers endorse to keep people prosperous and to hold on to the mandate of heaven. So how does Matteo Ricci and his Christianity fit into all of this? Well, let's think about why the king would employ him. Well, Ricci figured that if China was this civilized, then they must be doing something right. I mean, God must like them for some reason. So Ricci spent time in the court figuring out why his god must have favored the king, and what king would turn someone like that away. A smart king is going to give that guy an office and say, have at it. As long as you're helping my people understand why your god loves me, you can say whatever else you want. Ricci got on board with this. He saw a lot of potential in the idea of Tian. The Bible is full of references to Jesus Christ and his heavenly father. So Ricci expressed them as the heavenly court. And since the king was clearly wealthy and successful, then God's Holy Spirit must be with him. This was the mandate of heaven that allowed the king to rule the Chinese people. Ricci had a place in the royal court as long as Christianity made the king look good. But truth be told, the Catholic Church was not too thrilled with Ricci. They didn't appreciate Ricci going off and claiming that other people had religion too. The story of Matteo Ricci is a useful way to think about the question of the day. Does China have religion? Ricci thought so. Now I'm not asking you to agree with Ricci's assessment, but take some time to think through why Ricci thought so. Furthermore, how does this story impact your own critical definition of religion?